This week, the NTSB finds accident rates high for first flights of experimental amateur-built aircraft. The second time's a charm as SpaceX launches Dragon spacecraft to the ISS. The FAA proposes a rewrite of Part 145 rules, and a new LSA earns its airworthiness papers. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. As we were wrapping up production of this week's Airborne, our newsroom got a late breaking story. Jim Campbell reports. Thanks, Ashley. And guess what, folks? We don't have a breaking news story for you. We've got two. To make a long story short, it's been a big day for Boeing. Uh, the first 787 to come off the South Carolina production line flew today. Under the command of Tim Berg and Randy Neville, the airplane successfully conducted a five-hour test flight as more than 5,000 Boeing South Carolina employees looked on. The production flight test profile looked over the airplane's controls and systems in a series of scenarios designed to verify that the airplane operated as designed. During the flight, the crew checked the functionality of onboard systems at high and medium altitudes. They also checked backup and critical safety elements, including cabin pressurization, avionics, navigation and communication systems, and in addition to all that, they shut down and restarted each engine during the flight. According to test pilot Tim Berg, quote, the airplane performed exactly as we expected. The airplane will be flown to Fort Worth, Texas to be painted with Air India's livery before returning to Boeing, South Carolina for a mid-2012 delivery. Interesting stuff, but then it gets even stranger and more interesting than we ever expected. To make a long story short, the first parachute, no, let's call it something else, the first skydive without a parachute took place today, and it was a doozy. Following several days of Wisterberg rumors and anticipation of the skydiving community, UK stuntman Gary Connery, age 42, earned a distinctive place in the record books as he exited the helicopter at 2,400 feet with a modified wingsuit and swooped toward a hastily constructed runway that consisted of 18,600 cardboard boxes in an English field. Five seconds before he hit the target, he flared the suit to decrease his descent rate before impacting the boxes to break the fall. Connery's suit was specially modified, and the effort was supported by 100 volunteers and friends who spent six hours building the landing strip, which was 350 foot long, 40 feet wide, and 12 feet high. As a longtime skydiver, a little bit over 3,000 jumps, I gotta give the guy a tremendous amount of credit. It's an amazing achievement, and based on the video, it looked like it was a heck of a run. But between you, me, and the fence post, I'll leave that to younger jumpers with a lot more guts than I. For the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and Airborne, this is. Me, Jim Campbell, Skydiver Chicken. An NTSB study found that in 2011, 10 of 102 accidents involving experimental amateur-built aircraft built by their owner went down on their first flight. And of 125 accidents involving previously owned aircraft, 14 were on the new owner's first flight. The study, which was launched last year, evaluated all EAB accidents that occurred in 2011. The data shows that power plant failures and loss of control in flight are the most common accident occurrences by a large margin, highlighting the importance of pilots having the information and training necessary to safely operate their aircraft. As a result of the study, the NTSB made a total of 16 safety recommendations to the FAA and the EAA. Among the NTSB's recommendations to the FAA are to require detailed flight test plans from applicants for airworthiness certificates and incentives for EAB owners, builders, and pilots who complete flight tests in transition training. After a last-second glitch aborted the launch of the first commercial flight to the ISS on Saturday, a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida in the early morning hours Tuesday, carrying a Dragon capsule with a load of supplies for the crew of the station. The mission profile calls for the Dragon to dock with the station Friday following a near approach and systems checkout. While that rendezvous was not guaranteed, SpaceX founder Elon Musk said after the launch that the performance of the rocket and successful insertion into orbit made the mission a success.
The launch was scrubbed Saturday after an overpressure was noticed in one of the engines and it was shut down with about a half second on the countdown clock. But Tuesday's attempt was apparently flawless, leaving SpaceX and NASA officials hopeful that the Dragon would be able to complete its mission. You can follow the progress of this first commercial resupply mission to ISS on aero-news.net. An NPRM published by the FAA proposes to make wholesale changes to the avionics industry, and a major trade organization says those changes would have damaging and costly consequences. The agency proposes to remove radio and instrument ratings and allowing airframe rated repair stations to work on radios and instruments without qualifications or ratings. The proposal also eliminates many of the opportunities for mobile maintenance operations currently in use. Under this proposal, the system of ratings will be reduced from 8 to 5, and ratings definitions will be revised to clearly indicate the type of work that a repair station is authorized to perform. This proposal would not require a capability list, but would revise the capability list recording requirements for those repair stations that choose to use one. This is a potentially marked change for repair stations with class ratings that do not currently have a capability list of the items they maintain. The AEA says the changes would allow airframe rated repair stations to repair and alter radios and instruments without any specific ratings or obvious qualifications. They are strongly opposed to the measure and say they will respond to members' concerns within two weeks. Comments on the NPRM are due no later than August 20th. With thousands of older model single-engine airplanes still in service, Cessna embarked on a program last year to educate pilots about safety issues with the aircraft. The company announced this week that they are expanding the program. ANN's Tom Patton is here to explain. The program was designed to educate single-engine owners and operators about new inspection procedures. And this latest effort is aimed at the owners of 100-series single-engine piston aircraft around the world. It is intended to inform them about new supplemental aircraft inspection procedures that will be added to 100 series Cessna service manuals covering Cessna single-engine piston aircraft produced between 1946 and 1986. The plane maker has established a 40-hour training class in Wichita for mechanics to be trained on the non-destructive inspection techniques, such as ultrasound and eddy current. Those techniques will then be used to inspect high-time Cessna single-engine airplanes. The intent is not only to teach them what they're looking for, but also how to identify issues that can occur more frequently with older high-time airframes. The criteria for initial visual inspections will vary by model and aircraft age or hours of operation, and will focus primarily on signs of corrosion or structural fatigue damage. Cessna authorized service providers will have special training and access to specific equipment for the inspections and for repairs if they're needed. You can find out more at Cessna.com, and a short video explaining the new inspection procedures is available on their YouTube channel. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. There's another new entry into the LSA market. As a South African company, the Airplane Factory has received an airworthiness certificate for its Sling LSA. The Sling began development in 2006 in South Africa, and over 60 airplanes have been delivered in other parts of the world. In 2009, company owners Mike Blythe and James Pittman flew one of the Sling prototypes around the world, including legs over 22 hours over ocean, and even stopped in an Oshkosh to show off their plane a little. Now with the approval of the FAA, the airplane factory says it's producing five ready-to-fly airplanes each month, and many more in kit form. So if you want to build your own, the Sling LSA is available as an ELSA kit or an experimental amateur-built kit. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. 
Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. The news from Down Under is that Gips Aero has flown its new GA-10 turboprop for the first time. The 20-minute flight took place Tuesday in La Trobe, Australia at La Trobe Regional Airport. On their website, Gips described the GA-10 as filling a niche between larger, more expensive turboprops and smaller piston aircraft. It's been designed for such missions as air taxi, freight, skydiving, aerial survey, tourism, and defense. The aircraft will carry nine passengers and a pilot in a four-row configuration. It's powered by a Rolls-Royce 250 engine, according to a report in Australia Aviation. Entry into service is expected next year. The FAA has set aside 1202 as a special squat code for glider pilots not in contact with the ATC. The agency said in February that gliders operate under some flight and maneuvering limitations, and they may go from what appear to be stationary targets while climbing and thermaling to moving targets very quickly. They can be expected to make radical changes in flight direction to find lift and cannot hold altitude in response to an ATC request. Gliders may congregate together for short periods of time to climb together in thermals and may cruise together in loose formations while traveling between thermals. The FAA said an accident, many incidents, and an NTSB recommendation highlight the need for a national beacon code for gliders that are operating VFR and not in contact with ATC. Controllers will be informed of the code, what it represents, and under what limitation users are typically operating. The organizers of the Air Venture Cup race said Thursday that the Sport Air Racing League has offered to help make this year's event possible. And issued a statement, it says it's intended to clarify some of the things that have been said on social media sites and other web forums. Quote, we understand there have been significant changes at EAA over the past year and believe the misunderstandings could be a result of the recent changeover, the statement said. Regardless of these facts, we understand EAA's position remains the same and no longer wishes to have their name associated with the race. As such, we have agreed to remove all references to EAA from the website and other marketing materials. We are pleased to report, however, that EAA has agreed to continue providing support to race volunteers as they have done in the past, and we want to express our appreciation to EAA for doing so." End quote. The EAA said earlier this month that it was the race organizers who had decided to end their affiliation with the association though both sides have differing interpretations of what actually happened. Regardless, the race will go on this year as planned. Red Steel Jet Team pilot Douglas Gillis was fatally injured Friday afternoon when the L-39 he was flying to Van Nuys, California went down on takeoff from Boulder City Airport in Nevada. Also fatally injured was a passenger aboard the aircraft, 65-year-old Richard A. Winslow of Palm Desert, California. After arrival in Van Nuys, Gillis was to have flown commercially to Kansas City and joined the team for a performance at Whiteman Air Force Base. Instead, the team dedicated the performance to his memory. At Boulder City, witnesses said that the L-39 lost power just after takeoff and went down in the desert just west of the airport. Gillis declared an emergency just before the plane went down. A high-level NTSB FAA investigation is underway. 
and questions about the flight and another aircraft reportedly involved in what appears to be a two-ship departure is generating some serious concern. In just a moment, had enough of all those TFRs? Well, so has most of the aviation industry. I am Ashley Hale and you're Airborne on Aero TV. Abaddon is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy-to-use avionics. And the new IFD 540 GPS Navcom sets a new standard for simplicity in communication and LPV navigation. As a slide-in replacement for existing 530 series navigators, and with a highly intuitive touchscreen control, the IFD 540 makes it much easier to access the information you want when you want it, reducing head downtime and making flying more enjoyable. Finally, you have a choice, and the choice is easy. Avidine. Thanks for joining us. It's time for this week's barnstorming commentary. America's airspace should belong, most of all, to those pilots and other aviation professionals and businesses who use it on a daily basis, right? Well, with the proliferation of hundreds of TFRs, especially with the upcoming political season, we're not really sure anymore. Jim Campbell is here to explain. Jim? Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. Let me take a few minutes to uh, divert a little bit from some of the topics that are foremost on our mind to one that just keeps popping up uh, pun intended, right and left these days, and one that I think will be popping up even more frequently as the year goes on. We're in an election year. Airspace is becoming dotted more and more with TFRs. When the president wants to go on The View and talk to the girls, well, New York airspace gets shut down for hours at a time on just a few minutes' notice. The Republican Convention at Tampa is going to shut down a tremendous amount of airspace for several days and decimate the flight training and other commercial interests, uh, banner towing, you name it, in the area. Uh, when the president goes on vacation to Hawaii, we've already heard what happens to Hawaii. These poor folks get shut down. Businesses are being hurt and even failing because of it. And the Democratic Convention will, of course, uh, take its own swath of airspace and play games with that for as many days as they deem fit. The fact of the matter is this, while we have no doubt that national security is a serious concern for, for everybody who's an American citizen and, and frankly for around the world, I think security theater is taking place in most cases when a TFR is being announced. We know that there are better ways to protect special interests than taking over whole swaths of airspace with no warning thereby confusing both the pilot community as well as the poor folks who are trying to protect the area. I mean, the fact that their incursions isn't uh, unexpected, it's, it is expected. There's just not enough notice. The system is unworkable. We're catching the unwary with no notice. And on top of it, it goes out in the media. We all look like uh, fools as a result. Well, there's another pilot endangering the president. Baloney. It's not the way it works. This system is broke. Let's fix it. I'd like to see the associations quit crowing at, uh, to everybody about how good they are and start uh, responding to an industry rather than thinking they're more important than the industry. I'd like the FAA to start standing up to the security folks and explaining just what it is that this community is trying to do, this industry and this business is trying to do, and only issue TFRs when they really need to be uh, issued. And more important, to do so in a way that impinges on aviation commerce and aviation recreation minimally. And finally, more important than anything else, let's take a look at how this whole system works. It's just not right. There's got to be a better way to do it, and this ain't it. So for the moment, keep an eye out for those TFRs. They're out to get you. That F-16 off to your right may not have good intentions, and unfortunately, whether you know it or not, and in most cases you don't, you may be in violation. Not a good thing. For the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and of course, Airborne, I'm Jim Campbell. Preparations will soon be underway for the induction ceremonies of the inaugural class of honorees into the Aviation Educator Hall of Fame, a group of more than 20 aviation organizations and individuals led by a three-member board of directors recently established the Aviation Educator Hall of Fame. Begun in 2010 as an initiative of the Society of Aviation and Flight Educators, 
The SAFE board granted authorization to proceed with the hall as an independent organization in late 2011. According to the new organization's charter, the hall's purpose is twofold. The selection and recognition of qualified nominees who through extraordinary achievement and service have made outstanding contributions to aviation education and the public honoring of those individuals for their contributions to the development, advancement, and promotion of aviation education. Eligible nominees include ground, flight, and simulator instructors, pilot examiners, teachers, and academicians, authors, researchers, and innovators, maintenance and avionics instructors, and other aviation education-related professionals. Any person or group may nominate an individual for induction into the Hall of Fame. Nomination for the Hall's inaugural class of inductees are due by October 1, 2012. Residents of the Carolinas and the surrounding regions will have a unique opportunity to celebrate this Memorial Day weekend. The commemorative Air Force's iconic Boeing B-29 Super Fortress Bomber, or FIFI, the only remaining flying example of the aircraft in the world is coming to the Carolinas Aviation Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina on May 25th. The B-29 will arrive with the B-24 Diamond Lil, an equally rare World War II bomber and one of the only two still flying. The Brat 3, an actual combat veteran P-51 Mustang, from the Kavanaugh Flight Museum will accompany the bombers. The exhibit is sponsored by BAE Systems Incorporated and the Dowd Foundation and will be at the museum from May 25th to May 30th. Surely nothing could be finer than Warbirds in Carolina on Memorial Day weekend. And now it's time for AVW, the Aero Video of the Week. This week, members of the Red Bull Skydive team in wingsuits fly in formation with gliders. Really, it's an impressive ballet in the sky. To find this video, go to YouTube and search for Red Bull Skydive Team Gliders. The full video runs just over three minutes. If you have a suggestion for a future Aero video of the week, you can send us a link to news-spy at aero-news.net. Finally this week, 10 Bell helicopter workers who each pitched in $5 to play the Texas Lottery will be splitting a $28 million jackpot, or about $1.6 million each after taxes. The seven men and three women all took a sick day a week ago Monday to travel to Austin to claim their prize. One of the workers, Mario Mercado, told television station WFAA that since they all work in the same division, it quote, practically shut down the place. The close-knit group says they don't expect any squabbling over the money as they have known each other for years. None have said they will actually quit their jobs due to the windfall, but Mercado said his wife had given notice at her job. Hmm, and they say you can't make any real money in aviation. Get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And join us again next week for another edition of Airborne here on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching. See you next week.